Good evening and welcome to the Exiles Memorial Center. My name is Inej Brandam and I am the coordinator of this museum slash library and research center. Uh, welcome to tonight's conversation in the I Remember series in which we meet refugees who came through Portugal and Cascais in particular during the 1930s and the 1940s while fleeing Nazi persecution. Tonight, we meet Jean-Claude Van Italy, who with his family stayed at Pinsan Royal during the summer of 1940. This Pinsan Royal is located in Montsturil, one of the localities that makes up the Cascais municipality. This event will be in English. It is also in the format of a webinar. This ensures participants' privacy. This means that participants are not able to use their camera or their microphone. Therefore, if you uh, have to uh, ask a question, I would ask you to uh, please refer to the Q&A button that it should be at the bottom of your screen and ask your question there. Uh, before we continue, I would like, sorry, I would also like to share with you our acknowledgements. First, of course, to the team of the Exiles Memorial Center, uh, to the Don Luis Foundation and the Division of Museum and Cultural Promotion of the Cascais uh, Municipality. The Exiles Memorial Center is uh, the, under the supervision of the Cascais City Council and its programming is under the supervision of the Don Luis Foundation. Our colleagues at the Cascais Municipal uh, historical Archives and the Division of Communication at the uh, Kishkai City Council. We also owe a huge debt of thank you to Olivia Mattis at the Sosa Mensch Foundation, who uh, really were the ones who allowed us to begin this research project into refugee families who stayed in Kishkai. Um, refugee families who received Sosa Mendes visas who stayed in Kishkai. Uh, a huge thank you to uh, the Chantigar Foundation and in particular to Veronique. Uh, and of course, to Jean-Claude Van Italy, who is here with us. You can see him, you can't hear him yet, uh, and uh, with whom who will, we will be speaking uh, for uh, the remainder of this evening. Um, before we continue, I uh, just wanted to tell you a little bit about the Exiles Memorial Center. Uh, as you um, may be aware, uh, we are located in Estoril. That is another locality in the territory in the territory of Cuscais. The Exiles Memorial Center is located on the first floor of the uh, Istudil Post Office right here. And this is a photograph taken on the day of its inauguration in 1942. So this was a space at the time that was used by refugee families who were staying in Estoril at the time. Um, we have been in um, working as a museum for the past uh, 20 years. Uh, and so you can see that the municipality of Cascais is here near Lisbon and Estoril is right here. Now tonight uh, we will be speaking about the exodus of the Vanitali and Levy families. They, uh, we go up to the grandparents of Jean-Claude Vanitali and this exodus will take us from Belgium through the border city of saint des uh, into Fouras and then Bordeaux, and then from Bordeaux into Estoril over the summer of 1940, and then to the United States uh, uh, in late September of 1940. And we begin at the beginning, we begin in, um, we begin in Brussels, in Avenue Jeanne, uh, in a, a family home uh, where uh, Jean-Claude lived with his parents. So Jean-Claude, tell us a little bit more about what this enchanted garden was like in Brussels. Well, I can say that my mother in this picture is wearing what I refer to as la robe au poisson. It was always fascinating to me, each one of those Prince was of a fish in a fish well. Uh, we were picking red currants. We were outside of Brussels at that point. We lived in Brussels, Avenue Jeanne. 
my father was in the Belgian army when I was three years old uh, in, from the reserves. Avenue Jeanne was a small apartment building. My mother was at the time in 1940, my mother was all of 27 years old. I was almost four. My maternal grandparents, the Lévy, lived square en Biorix, 17 square en Biorix. My paternal grandparents, Tilly, uh, Tilly Vanitelli, Tilly Jacobs Vanitelli, was an opera singer. And my paternal grandfather was uh, a stockbroker. He had been told by his father, Samuel I. Vanitelli, in Maastricht in 1905, I'll take care of being Jewish, you take care of business. So he moved with his wife to Brussels and eventually he was quite successful. He built a house at 212 Avenue Montjoie. Um, my father and my mother met at a tea dance in uh, outside of Brussels. Uh, and uh, there, it was love at first sight, I assume. Uh, my mother was, I think at that point, 18 or something like that. But my grandfather, uh, Fernand, Vanit uh, Fernand Lévy, required that my parents wait a little while before, wait two years before they would get married. Uh, on the left, you see my mother's mother, Germaine Lévy, Germaine Rotembourg Lévy, who had been born in France. And on the right is my mother's sister, Pauline Lévy, who, or Nelly Pauline, or Nelly Pauline Lévy, who uh, came with us through the, uh, through the, through the bombs really in, 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 in uh, France. And my grandfather, Fernand Lévy, who was about 50 at the time in 1940, I think, um, and who smoked a great deal, as I remember. Um, so we were, I guess you could say we were a bourgeois family. Uh, that was me. Um, I, I used that on a poster for a one person show in America not too long ago, maybe 20 years ago. In the morning of 1940, May 10th, I was asleep in my room. I heard a lot of loud noises. It felt like it was the middle of the night. I woke up. I was scared because of the loud noises coming from outside. I lowered the sides of my bed. I tiptoed into the living room where my mother was packing. She was moving around fairly fast. I asked what were the noises outside. She said, oh, it's the garage next door. They're repairing cars or they're repairing trucks. I knew she was lying because my mother and I were very close. As I mentioned, or as I put as a caption on that picture, we had been living, the two of us, almost as if we were in an enchanted garden. But now my mother was coping. She was coping very well, but she was dealing with me as yet another obstacle because she had to get out. So I said, can I, she said, we're going for a ride with your grandparents, with Oma and Opa, my father's parents. I said, can I bring my big teddy bear? She said, no, bring the little teddy bear. There's no room in the car. And then I began to cry. She yelled to the young maid, John. She said, put his rust color coat on with his rust colored cap. And we left. We, uh, we went to my grandparents' house, my grandmother Tilly, the opera singer, and her husband, the stockbroker. We met outside the house, uh, and we, we, we then went to a restaurant outside of Brussels where my, out, my, my coat was taken off downstairs. I was changed, and I finally began to cry. I mean, something was terribly, terribly wrong. Meanwhile, my maternal grandparents, uh, Fernand and Germaine, were still home. They went with Pauline Lévy, Nelly Pauline Lévy. They went to downtown to, to uh, buy some food supplies. They came back. They set up an air raid shelter in the basement. But that night there was bombing. And so when my mother called from the coast where, she, where we'd gone, they, she urged them to come join they did ultimately do that. Meanwhile, my uncle Jacques was in the Belgian army. It's incredible that my family were in a sense all writers. My uncle Jacques wrote a journal. 
My grandmother wrote a journal, Germaine. She kind of raided the hotels or the fields where we happened to be staying. Uh, so they joined us at saint des balles where already it was not easy to get food supplies. They took the car, the car, they bought a cart, which as my grandmother says in her journal, at what a price. And they, uh, my mother actually drove us across the border into France. She went to a small town on the Belgian coast where they thought the weight would be less. It was indeed less to get into France. When they got into France, my grandmother Germaine wrote that everything on wheels was on the roads of France. Bicycles, everything, everything, baby carriages, anything. We were extraordinarily lucky to be in a car. Uh, Where was your father at the time? Well, my father, as I mentioned, was in the reserves, uh, the Belgian army reserves. He figured that the invasion was happening when he noticed that all the uh, men were given five days off. And he thought, well, somebody must know something. And at that point, he told my mother, be ready to drive away. And then she was ready to drive away. When the uh, invasion did indeed occur on May 10th, 1940, when we left, my father began marching with his company toward the sea, toward the sea coast. Uh, so did my uncle Jacques, who was in the in the in the uh, army. My father stopped in Brussels and went to his apartment, where he took what he, he said he got my mother's pearl necklace and he got a lot of papers, and he went back to his men. They continued marching toward the coast. When they passed somewhere near Bruges, my father said he saw the Belgian king walking around with a lot of generals. He saw by the hunch of the Belgian King's soldier, uh, shoulders that surrender was on its way. Um, my uncle Jacques also in his uh, company, they had to move forward. There were bombs falling. They also got to the coast. He um, went to say to his, his captain, his captain said, we're surrendering. And my father's captain said also, we're surrendering. I can't tell you what to do, but uh, good luck, old man. So at that point, my father took a truck with the men who wanted to come with him, went to the coast, ultimately went to Dunkirk, where they, he gave a letter from my mother. They planned all this very carefully, my father and his father, and all of them actually. So there was a place, a villa they'd rented with friends across in France, where he sent a letter to my mother saying that this is what was happening. Ultimately, my father put on a, a uh, a British helmet, and then rode out to the British uh, uh, boats in a rowboat that he found on the beach. They took him up. He was drenched. He said he was half naked. He became a translator. He told he told them he told them what each of the people on the boat were doing, and eventually he went to Folkestone, and then they kept him in jail for about twenty four hours. He told them that he had been once a uh, someone who had done a an apprenticeship at a British firm in London, and then they treated him like he was very much one of them. And he eventually came back, maybe a few days later, with the only Belgian platoon that returned to France. And he joined us where we were in Fouas, uh, in France. Which... Get, so we, we left your family in saint in uh, near the 10th of May, and then they go to Fouas. Do you remember how long that journey took? No, but I, I we rented we rented a villa in Fouras. Villa. It was we rented a house in Fouras. Probably by the time my father joined us, I'm guessing it was it was always a matter of days. Uh, the the invasion was on the 10th of May. The 25th of May was my birthday. I remember sitting standing on a balcony with my grandmother. She said, "Always remember." that your fourth birthday, you were in France. She herself was born in France, so that was a big deal. Um, and uh, and my, my father, he must have joined us toward, still in May, probably by the end of May, because we were still traveling. We got to Bordeaux. We, my father joined us in Fouras. My paternal grandparents decided that they wanted to take a boat to England. Um, they left, that left from Bordeaux. They took a boat, the Berenice, indeed, that's a picture of the boat. 
I remember standing on the dock holding my parents' hands and waving at my grandparents who were on the deck of the Berenice. The next day, my father learned, or my father learned six weeks later, but the next day, the Berenice was torpedoed. My grandparents were drowned. Uh, what's quite extraordinary is that they were rarely mentioned in, as I was growing up. Um, there was almost nothing said about the war as I was growing up or about our Jewishness for that matter. Uh, but they, they, so my grandparents were killed, but we continued on with my other grandparents, my aunt Nellie Pauline and my mother, of course, and father. We, we were in Bordeaux. It's amazing to look at that picture. I mean, amazing. Everybody, all the Jews, apparently there were some 30 to 40,000 Jews that wanted desperately to get out of France. Uh, this brave Aisti de Sousa Mendes, who was the Portuguese consul, uh, was decided to issue visas despite orders from his superior, uh, Salazar, the dictator of Portugal. He very bravely gave visas out to Jews, to about 30 or 40,000 Jews. My father, who was, as they say in French, débrouillard, he was very able to cope. When, he, when we entered Bordeaux, he met a friend of his, Ida Berenbrocht, who had just, was just leaving Bordeaux. She said she had an apartment uh, above the consulate. My father immediately rented it, came down the fire escape, joined someone, uh, found a 12-year-old boy called Jerry Brunel, who was directing traffic there at the, at the uh, Portuguese consulate. Jerry Brunel was a German born, traveling by himself. And he and the consul said to my father, if you take Jerry Brunel with you, well, of course we'll give you, we'll give you, we'll give you visas. So we took Jerry Brunel with us in the car and then went to the uh, border where we were online for a very long time. I should say there were other members of the family. There was my, my uh, grandfather's sister, Irma, who lived with her daughter in Paris. Can I they just interrupt had... you? Can I just interrupt you for a minute uh, sure. before we move on to Irma and, and Luz? Um, uh, I, I want to tell the people who are watching that what we're seeing here, of course, is an image of Aristide de Sousa Mendes, the, the Portuguese consul in Bordeaux, who, um, disobeying the, the rules of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, took it upon him to, to give to hand out visas in June, in, in, in mid-June to late June 1940, to anyone who requested it, instead of following the protocol that had been set out that denied from the outside visas to, to most of the people who needed it. Um, in the case of your family, their visas were recorded in the visa book, uh, and uh, and they are here. So it's two visas, one for uh, the Vanitalis and the other for the Livies. Mm. And the reason why this is important, this document is very important, is because it 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 gives us information about the nature of these visas. There is a lot of debate about how many people were rescued by Erishtich Tsozemienc. And what your family's visas show is that two visas rescued six people. Oh. And so this is extremely important. Uh, and, and it explains sometimes some of the disparities in this calculation, in this understanding of the number of people that were rescued by Erishtich. And then, of course, on top of that, there are the visas that were handed out and that were left unrecorded on this, this visa book. This visa book is currently held at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Portugal, and they do have a digital digitized version of it. If uh, for people who are interested in it, they can consult the Sosa Mensch Foundation and, um, and, and see other examples of, the, of this visa book and other families who, who were rescued by um, Sosa Mendes. Um, I do have a question about your family's journey uh, between could, 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 Brussels and France. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. I, uh, I'm looking at his face, at Aristide de Sosa Mendes' yeah. face. It's almost as if he's holding his breath. Uh, it must yes. have been so difficult for him to do what he did. He knew that by doing this, it was the right thing to do. But in some way, he was he was going to lose his own 
way of life and his own life. And he did, he had, he became a pauper when he returned to Portugal. Yes. Um, hats off to you. <laughs> he, uh, he, he, he did know the risks and, and the, the, the price that he would be paying. He had already been warned not to hand out visas without prior authorization. So he yeah. knew he was disobeying and that he would pay a heavy price because he was already under, under probation, let's put it that way, under observation for the possibility of, of giving out these visas. Um, the but question that for, I for had- speak, Speaking for the many, many, many who he saved, and I gather I'm one of the last ones alive to speak it, thank you. <laughs> well, um, I didn't do anything, but on behalf no, no, of- No, I'm speaking to, I'm speaking to high <laughs> students or something. I'm looking at his picture and identifying a lot, yeah. Um, he's, um, my, my question was about your, your, your family. Um, when, when you were driving, when you were, when your father was still in, in the army, who was doing the driving? Who was, my mother was, my mother was doing the your driving. Your mother was doing the driving. While my father was in the army, my mother was doing the driving. At that time, they didn't issue driver's licenses in Belgium. My mother had driven once to Germany when my father was doing an apprenticeship she had hardly ever driven, but she was the one doing the driving. She was extraordinarily brave. She was very brave. She was very beautiful. She drove. I was being, I remember being held on my aunt's lap in the passenger seat. My mother was driving. You can imagine she was driving through bombs. I tried to crawl into her lap. My aunt held me back. I remember my mother saying, Pas maintenant, chérie. Pas maintenant. Not now, darling. Not now. I can I can hardly imagine the tension that must have been in her body, but I inherited a lot of that tension. I really did. I I, I that's that tension that was in my mother's body remained with me in my body. I think for the rest of my life. Not, wouldn't surprise anyone. Uh, <laughs> did, did did your uh, did how did your mother know how to get around? Was she using the main roads? Was she following directions? Well, when we left, when we left, when we left uh, Saint Isabel, as I mentioned, she deliberately used the smaller roads. Okay. As for the rest, I'm not sure how she did. I don't imagine that there were as many roads as there are now in France. But she, 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 she got to. Four, she, oh, first she went to where that villa was that they had rented, and got that mail from my father, the envelope that he had asked the admiral on the beach at Dunkirk to mail for him. He had, and then she, she knew he was coming. Why they got to Fouras, I don't know. At some point, the cart, which they had bought for the luggage, overturned. Uh, my, my grandmother had mentioned what a great price they'd paid for that cart. Frequently, the young maid who we brought with us uh, sat on top of the cart and waved to soldiers. When it overturned, she had gone off with some soldiers, so she wasn't hurt. But uh, it overturned, and I remember my grandmother and my aunt lamenting the jelly that got on their blouses. Uh, it was really awful. And my my grandmother mentions how kind. Um, I think his name was Jean Parry, one of the people who came by. How kind he was. He found them a place to stay. In, at that particular night, it was in his barn, and then he helped them to find a place in Fouras. People were extremely kind, as my grandmother recorded in her journal. They, we, sp we spent, uh, before getting to that villa, we spent, or after, I don't know, but I think it was before, we spent a night in a barn. There were two beds. Uh, one was a large bed, which my grandmother, uh, Tilly, was in, as she wasn't terribly well. Uh, that was the grandmother who went on the boat. And then there was a small bed. Uh, I just waved high from the small bed. I thought it was all very interesting and exciting. Everybody else slept on the floor. So we got to Fouras after, after, uh, after all of that. My, my, my grandfather's sister, Irma, who, who had moved to Paris because she had an abusive husband, so the story goes, she and her daughter, Luce, who was an accountant, tried very hard to join us in Fouras. They took cattle cars to get to Fouras. They did get to Fouras, but they got there 24 hours after we'd left. Uh, their letters extant, I'm translated some of those letters. 
uh, I hope eventually to put them all in a book. But there are letters extended in which she says, we came in cattle cars. She was so, she said they found a letter from my grandmother to her two sisters. They found a letter from my mother to, to Jeanne who wasn't around, but they found nothing for themselves. And had they joined us at that moment, they would undoubtedly have been part of my daily life growing up on Long Island. But as it was, they eventually, they stayed there for two or three weeks. They took a train back to Paris. They were in Paris for a little while. They were in contact with my grandfather's brother, Emile, who had gone to Nice, who sent them some money. But they were rounded up. They were, they were put into the concentration camp at Auschwitz and they were killed. Um, and the same thing happened, uh, my, another person who was killed was my grandfather's uh, sister-in-law, who's uh, who who uh, Tante Hede, who actually was who lived in Brussels with her husband um, Isidore, who had died in 1932 of eating bad oysters. Uh, she was apparently a friend of Albert Einstein's, a childhood friend of Albert Einstein's. She lived in Brussels. She was living with her sister and her brother-in-law. She was a very cultured, lovely lady, apparently. And she was, they were also rounded up, taken to the center, I think in Malin, and then from there shipped to Auschwitz. In so, uh, yeah, I, I do want to mention them because they, although they, they were very obscure, I hardly ever heard of them. And when I was a child, had they not been killed, they would have been everyday relatives. Relatives yeah. with you. Yes. Um, we, we do, um, at, at the Memorial Center, we focus, of course, on the families who arrived in Kishkaj. So for the vast majority, uh, these are, of course, we, we tell family stories of, of uh, a certain type of triumph, in any case, over persecution. Uh, but we do make a point of explaining and, and, and of, uh, of, of making sure that people who visit us know that this triumph was at the cost of a loss of uh, families and loved ones, communities, uh, property, and, and so that it is not uh, just a story of uh, happy families, it's a story of tremendous loss. And, um, and so it, it, is, it is also important for us that we, we honor uh, the memories of, of those relatives that did not make it to uh, Portugal. Thank you, Inez, for saying that. It's, it, I think also it's terribly important. All of those people who were lost, uh, certainly in my family and everybody, were their loss is, is, was, was part, of, part of my growing up, their absence in a way, although I didn't know it. So once you, uh, you got the visas, uh, do you have any memory of crossing into Spain? I remember, yes, I do remember crossing into Spain. Uh, we were at the border. They stopped us. They wanted to know who Jerry Brunel was. It took about five hours at the border. And finally, one of the border guards said to my father, uh, do you know anybody uh, in, in Leiden, in Leiden, Holland? And uh, my my father my father uh, said that uh, he had um, he had been his his great uncle had been dean of the University of Leiden, and that opened all the doors. Suddenly he let us go through. We were able to take Jerry Bruno. Everything happened, and my my grandmother mentioned that they were so polite and whatever it was, we got through at that moment. So that was apparently a uh, very. Uh, lucky. We were fortunate. It was not only that my father and my family and my mother was very brave, that they were brave and they were smart, but also that they had some resources and luck, a luck. lot of luck. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to take a, a little bit here to talk about um, uh, Jerry Brunel. Mm -hmm. um, he was uh, a young boy from Cologne, uh, and he was sent in 1938. Um, he was sent by his family to live in Belgium with family friends. Uh, with the um, invasion of Belgium, he hitchhiked alone uh, from Belgium to Bordeaux, uh, and then he met your family and continued his, um, his journey into Portugal. And he did uh, travel uh, by himself into, um, 
into uh, the United States. And later on uh, in his life, he became the, the president of um, AFBAU. Um, uh, AFBAU, um, for those who don't, who don't know, uh, was a, a, a newspaper, um, a New York newspaper uh, that was aimed at the German Jewish community, the emigre uh, German Jewish community. And the AFBAU existed on paper until the 1990s, and then it became um, an electronic version. And today it is published in Zurich. Uh, so it's no longer published uh, in New York. And Jerry Brunel became quite, is well known um, uh, within the, the, the refugee community in, in New York for having led uh, the newspaper for such a long time. Um, that, that particular, if I may interrupt you a moment, yeah, that sure. particular piece of newspaper, that particular paper that you had illustrated there, December 22nd was my mother's birthday, so I, I, I noticed that, yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what did you see? This I, at the bottom, at the yeah. bottom of the Aufbau oh. of that particular, uh, oh, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. I see it. So, and at that stage, because it's December 22nd, 1944, you were already living um, in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, so you arrive uh, into uh, Lisbon. Um, we know that you you came through probably through the, the southern border um, and that you made your way into Lisbon. Um, we did wonder why your family wasn't sent to a mandatory area of residence. And uh, we think that maybe your diplomatic passports um, were a reason. Would you tell us a bit more about those, how your father got those passports? Sure. My father, when he got to Fouras, I remember I was shelling peas in the in the back garden. My grandmother said, Look, go to the front door. Somebody's here. And my father came to join us. My father took the next day or the day after, took a train because military personnel could get on trains to Tours, where he had a friend who was part of the, well, not to Tours, actually, he took it to Paris because he thought that the consulate was there. He had a friend, Conrad Sefer, who worked there. My father had been to an economics and uh, diplomatic school, so he had a lot of diplomatic friends. And he, he, he found that the consulate was closed in Paris. He remembered he'd seen a lot of cars in Tours. He took the train back to Tours. Indeed, the consulate had moved there. He found his friend Conrad Sefer. Conrad said that he had seen a motorcade go by in Tours, which included Winston Churchill. And he concluded from that that there, that there was going to be, uh, the invasion was happening in That's Vichy right. and so forth. So, my, so he gave my father a car and he assigned him to be a diplomat or to work in the consulate in Lisbon. So that's how he got those papers. Uh, it was all it was all friendship and and luck. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, so we we also we rushed through Spain or we yes to get to Lisbon as fast as we could because my father wanted to see his uncle David, who was not really an uncle but an old family friend, Van Buren. Uh, before he left, but he actually, he and his wife took one of the last clipper ships from Lisbon and got to New York. Uh, and we met them again in New York. But were my, they American my, citizens? Uh, were they American citizens? I don't believe they were at the time. No, they were, they were Belgians. Yeah. And then you, so you anyway, arrived that, and to from, Lisbon. And from, yeah, you we arrived stayed in Lisbon. In Lisbon. I guess we stayed in Lisbon. I don't know what happened. And then we got to Estoril. How we got to Estoril, I don't know. My father did indeed work at the uh, at the at the con at the uh, Belgian consulate in Lisbon. We waited. We hoped against hope that we would get visas to go to America. Again, my my maternal grandfather. This was again luck. And uh, my maternal grandfather had a colleague in New York named Newton J. Rice. He wrote to him and he said, can you help us in any way? Newton J. Rice knew the American Secretary of State, Cordell Hull, wow. who I mean, it, it just, in a way, I, I mean, I'm so terribly lucky that all of this happened. Uh, Cord Cordell Hull, I guess, in response to Newton Rice, sent a telegram to the American consulate in, in uh, Lisbon saying, give Mr. Levy, my grandfather, and his family visas to come to America. So we got those visas. We got on a boat, uh, the Akuzaki Maru, which was a Japanese luxury liner. 
which we was one of the last times that a Japanese boat, it was, what was it, six months or so before the uh, Japanese entered the war. But in the meantime, we stayed while we were waiting those six weeks, we stayed in, it, it is Estoril, is it? Uh, that, that Monte, it's, it's Monte Estoril. It's a, a locality that is between Estoril and Cascais along the coast. It's very small. Right. And it's where I live. It's where I actually am right now. I am about five minutes away from this building, a five minute really? walk from this building. Interesting. That's, well, emotionally, I'm probably still there too. I, 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 I remember being there in the post. My very first words of English were no fish, no soup. <laughs> which I said to the to the waiter. Most people say mama, but I said no fish, no soup, because for some reason I didn't want any fish in any soup. But I, I was apparently learning English because we were confident that we were going to somehow or other get to America. Get to America. So we did. I, I was acting out a lot as a child. I would in, I slept in my parents' oh. room. I would, tear, I would tear the paper off the wall. I would stick my hand through the slats of my bed and I would keep tearing the wallpaper off. My father would be very angry and every night I would do it again. I, there was, drinking water was separate. So it came in a large green glass bottle. So every night I would get up, I'd pour myself some water. One night I remember getting up, the bottle seemed very heavy. I'd been bowled out for spilling water. So I went to the window. I tried to pour myself some water holding the bottle out the window. I guess I decided it was too heavy or it was too heavy. It dropped, it crashed onto a wicker chair below on a balcony, which apparently would have killed somebody if it hadn't been Friday the 13th. And that couple who were living downstairs, an older couple had gone for a walk exceptionally. So those kind of things kept happening all the time. Um, it was a very yeah. traumatic moment, yeah. I was remembering that you, um, I was once asking you about this, this routine of you going to bed and if you were alone in bed, in, in your bedroom uh, at the Pensam and you explained that it was your aunt Nelly who would put you to bed. Yes, she, well, she would put me to bed sometimes. Uh, she, and then, and then I would, I would call across the hall where I had some friends who were older than I and like six six of them would come over and say good night to me when they didn't come and quickly enough I would yell for them and one night my aunt Nellie downstairs in the in the uh, dining hall heard me yelling she came up she screamed at me I, people wanted me to behave they had enough problems with the entire war going on I was supposed to behave I, I, I had you were to four look. years old you had just turned four I had just turned four, so my job was to be good and not to know why I was being good. good. I didn't know. My mother and my father, they couldn't explain to me what was happening, obviously. But at the same time, well, it was an interesting time. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. stayed at the, the Pensão Royal um, at the historical archives. I wasn't able to locate um, a photograph of the period, but we did locate uh, a photograph from the 1980s. I think anyone in Portugal will recognize these uh, these lovely uh, trash cans, trash bins. Um, <laughs> and you can see that the, the building was a little bit run down by then. Uh, the building was then refurbished and this is how it exists today. So this is the original building. Um, where, is, you, where is the sea from there, Inez? It is the sea, uh, you, from any of these windows here, you face the sea oh. with a non-obstructed view. Wow. So this is, this is uh, Avenida de Saboia. It's the main street of Monsturil. It is a hill. So Monte means mount. Uh, mm -hmm. And so this is going up the first part of a very steep hill. Uh, and then you have Avenida Marginal uh, for a little bit parallel to this street, but that is running uh, at a lower altitude. And Avenida Marginal was a freshly opened thoroughfare. And then as you went down the hill, there was the train station, which is your pro probably your father took the train every day to go into Lisbon. My, my father the, loved trains. My father <laughs> so he, very he fond of trains, it. memorized a, train schedules. Yeah. It's a beautiful train ride. It's a beautiful train ride even to this day. So uh, oh. he probably did take that train. And then it's right. the beach. And so it's it, it's a five minute walk again uh, between, from right. the sea to uh, to the building that is today it, this it, apartment complex, and the it, garden stretches all the way here to the end of the street. It's a whole block, and hmm. uh, the the this photograph is actually the back, 
And the oh. back faces another street called Avnida de Zakasish. So this is not the front of Pesach Royal, this is the back of Pesach Royal, mm -hmm. and this was the front facing the sea. Right. Well, right? If, if yes, if I may say, if I may continue with that story of dropping the, the, the green, the heavy green glass bottle, uh, the next morning, I remember the one of the maids who worked in the in the hotel came up to tell my mother something. She was carrying a new glass bottle. She was furious. She was like a, a sentinel. My mother was taking a bath. She said she would wait for my mother to leave the bathroom. My mother came out of the bathroom. The maid said to my mother that my that I, her son, was a criminal. Uh, and that I had dropped this thing, and I, it was, as I said before, I would have killed either the old lady or the old man who lived, uh, who were out on their balcony in their wicker chairs every night, except it was Friday the 13th. So my mother, being given this news, said that she would consult my grandfather. She, my grandfather came in. They said that they, my mother said she wouldn't tell my father what a terrible thing had happened because he might get too angry but she would talk to my grandfather about what to do so I remember looking out the window maybe one of those windows probably one of those windows at my grandmother I'm sorry at my mother and my grandfather going for a walk along the beach discussing what my punishment would be I remember my mother had a sort of camel's hair coat on her shoulders and my grandfather was smoking his usual cigarette they were discussing my fate so they do you finally, remember do you remember what their decision was? <laughs> yes, I do remember the decision. They came back. My grandfather said he wasn't sure, but he thought I might have to go to jail. And um, and my mother said again that she she was going to save me from speaking to my father by not speaking to my father because he was a disciplinarian, etc. And that carried on until uh, yes, that attitude. When we were on the boat, finally, on the Akuzaki Maru, I remember my mother came one night to sit on the edge of my bed as we were traveling. And she said, "You, your mother loves you very, very much. Mommy loves you very, very much. But if you don't learn to be a better boy, if you don't learn to be a good boy, mommy will have to love you less. Ooh. So I didn't know what, I mean, mommy's love, how I wanted to be a good boy. I had to learn to be a good boy. So I, 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 I but it, it stayed with me that I, I had to learn to, on my own to at least, at least put up the mask of a good boy, the facade of a good boy. I tried to be a good boy. Uh, and that went along a lot with the tension that I felt in my body. I think, spoke, I think it also had to do with my becoming a playwright eventually. Yeah. She spoke with you in French. We. Oui. Mami, all, all of your mami, life, ma, never ma, switched ta, into English. Mami, mami, mami t'aime beaucoup, mais si tu n'apprends pas à être un bon garçon, un gentil garçon, mami devra te, devra t'aimer moins. Something oh, like Lord, that. That's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> that's, well, that's very... well, what was she to say? I mean, in a way, I had. To, in a way, she was perhaps in her mind, she was saving me. I'm not blaming anybody for anything. My parents were really wonderful, but. It's what I've was had, done at that, the time. That's what I had now. to fight for the rest of my life, yeah. <laughs> um, and so then you got to the United States, and so your family settled immediately in Great Neck? No. We, okay. we, well, first I remember we, we stopped by the Statue of Liberty. The boat did. I couldn't understand why everybody was so terribly excited by the Statue of Liberty, but they were. And then we got to New York. We, didn't, we did not have to stop in Ellis Island. I remember my father insisting that my my aunt and my grandparents, instead of writing their last name, which was Levy and obviously Jewish, he insisted that they inscribe themselves on the book as Lay. They leave out the V, yeah. which they did, but they always referred to themselves as Levy. But there was that feeling that we were in danger the whole time. And so there was a hiding of, of the Jewishness. Um, then we went to the, we stayed first of all in the Hotel Taft on Times Square. I remember my aunt Nellie took me to the automat. I remember to, to I remember putting coins in the automat. 
Can you explain to those of us who've never seen one, what is the automat? Ah, you really missed something by not seeing the automat. The automat was where you could go. It was a restaurant where you put a, you put a coin in a, in a slot, which was next to a grounded glass window. There were a whole series of vertical column of rounded glass window. Behind each window, there was a food. And what was particularly, what I remember particularly was there were squares of red jello which and there were also very carefully cut lemon meringue pieces of lemon meringue pie you put a, a quarter or whatever it was in the in the slot and you would the, the 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 door would swing open dramatically you would reach in you'd pull out your 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 shaking red jello you felt you'd really done something <laughs> so that was my first feeling of new york um and yeah it, it, it was it was quite extraordinary. From there, we went to uh, Forest Hills, where my parents had an apartment across the street, across the hall from my grandparents and my aunt. So and that's in Elton, Queens. In Queens, indeed, okay. uh, where they'd have the tennis tournaments. Uh, yes. And and then <laughs> and then ultimately we moved to Great Neck on Long Island, which was uh, a community that had a lot of Jews that as Jews prospered who lived in Brooklyn frequently, they would come and move to Great Neck. Um, and so we moved, we moved to Great Neck at that point to Radnor Road, which is where I ultimately began going to school. What the picture that we're looking at here or that I'm seeing here, yeah. I believe is when I returned to Brussels. I think that's right. Or is that in Great Neck? I don't know. I, I'm not sure. I think that was the, the, when you, but you I sent think that's me. The me on, I think that's me on the right at any rate. Yeah, this is you here, clearly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, you do look a little bit uh, um, like Cowed older. Is the word. <laughs> <laughs> not, not really happy. No. Um, and then you made your professional life in America. You, you became a playwright. Uh, you... Um, yeah. You you really uh, embraced the 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 avant garde of what was being done there. Would you would you tell us about your plays? Yeah. And I've I've highlighted three here, but uh -huh. of course you have many many more. Well, uh, and the, the the best one, I mean the most uh, talked about, also because of the series Mad Men, is is America Hurrah. For us who are uh, of a, of, a, of a later time and live in Portugal, uh, mm -hmm. we will have seen America Hurrah without even knowing. That that's what we were watching. Uh, well, I, I I mentioned before that I became I really became quite fascinated with facades, the fronts that people put on themselves, and that governments put on themselves. What you show to the world and what's really behind the facade. Anyway, that first one is that's a picture of Jane Lowry was the name of the actress. It was a, it was a short play called War. It, it was, it opened on December 22nd, precisely my mother's birthday, 1963, at the Bar Albee Wilder Playwrights Unit in Greenwich Village. It was about two actors who, a younger actor and an older actor with a lot of sexual tension between them. They would almost come to battling each other when they would conjure almost emotionally they would conjure this woman who could be from next door or who could be a dream. This woman in this Edwardian dress who was really the mother figure. She would come in and the last image of that play was the two of them ritually punching each other's fists, vying for her attention. Attention. Yeah, because it's so interesting, the, the family and the emotional causes of what happens in the microcosm. I think we wars don't just happen. Um, what's going on now don't just happen. They are in some way connected to our, our private lives. I became a member of the Open Theater in, I was so lucky that I, that happened. It was in Greenwich Village in the 1960s, early 60s. Uh, my, 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 my partner in this life, nine to the degree that I had one was Joe Chaikin who had founded the open theater, which was a troupe of actors in the village. We were all trying to discover through theatrical exercises, the truth of what we really felt, as opposed to what we were been told to feel or the fronts or the facades. So ultimately we created a play there called The Serpent, 
which was a collaborative play, was a, it, we learned to collaborate to create. I was the words person, but it was a creative collaboration. And from there, I decided that I wanted to find a, when I was 30, I decided I really had to try at some point to be a commercial playwright, because if I was going to work in lofts for all my life, I, I, it didn't suit my bourgeois background. So I had to try something. Um, so I put together three plays. I found a producer, Stephanie Sills. Um, my father agreed that he would invest some money. A friend of his also agreed that she would invest some money. It cost all of $17,000. It was three plays called Motel, TV, and Interview. Each of them uh, a play by itself, but altogether they made up what I considered to be a portrait of America. Motel was for three large dolls. I'd written, I'd read a lot of Edward Craig, uh, Craig's and, and I was very influenced by Antonin Artaud, who a lot of us were influenced by in the avant-garde. And we put that on in, on a off-Broadway in a play, in a, in a theater called the Pocket Theater, a small theater. And it was a huge success. Why was it a huge success? Because it, it expressed what many of, of, of us on the left were feeling. We did not want the Vietnam War. We were protesting the Vietnam War. This tried to dig under there and say, America may be apple pie on one hand, but on the other hand, we're shooting people in Vietnam. Put it together for yourself. So people needed to hear that. That became a big deal. America, hurrah. I kept, do I kept you, doing. Hmm? I was going to ask, um, do you think that your views on, 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 on America and on, on this, on, on conflict, on, on these two societies sort of being the same society, but coexisting and not one in particular, not acknowledging the other. Do you think that, that you're, you yourself were an outsider looking at that or did you write it as an American? I don't, I, both, both. I was not an outsider looking at that. I was not objective. I was looking, I was digging inside myself for my own feelings and seeing the distortions. The Motel is a play in which, as I say, it's all for puppets. There's a monologue in it, uh, which is for the motel keeper. She speaks in a very heightened language, which I was flattered to have Tennessee Williams praise a lot um, on, on the Studs Turkle show. In the meantime, these two people, these two vulgar looking puppets arrive at the motel. They write graffiti on the wall. They eventually, they strip their clothes off. And ultimately as the motel keeper doll keeps talking in her light, heightened language, they, they, they destroy her. They take the, the doll, which was the motel keeper, obviously the actor slipped out of it, she, and they take it and they, they rip it apart and they walk through the theater. At that time, you could still shock an audience. Yeah. Now, events in the world are such that I don't think that shock is what we need, but at that moment, you could really shock people and make them think. So that's what that was about. Um, and Bag Lady? Bag Lady was a character who was oh, herself, sorry. yeah, her, who was herself a refugee, the Bag Lady. I had, I had interviewed a Bag Lady on 72nd Street, a real Bag Lady, uh, but this was based on really, she, the, the real Bag Lady was not a, a refugee, but my character was. Uh, she'd come from Russia. She was played by Shami Chaikin, the sister of Joe, uh, beautifully played by Shami Chaikin, who was a very, very talented actor, who would, she was living on the street, but she had extraordinary perceptions about what was going on in the world. So it was a monologue for Shami. Um, it, 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 did, it did very well. It was again, this is what you get. This is what I see. Um, this is a facade which is being torn apart by the monologue of this particular um, character. And then I'm going to move fast, fast forward and talk about one of your most recent um, creations. And would you tell us a bit more about Mila, Great Sorcerer? Well, 
this was a, this was my, my my Tibetan Buddhist teacher Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche had a tremendous influence on me. I, I he was he was my my Buddhist master, and he he did a year's retreat in my house. He he at one point asked me to write for him a little screenplay for the tankas in the Swedish Museum of Milarepa, the great hermit saint, who was a singer himself. So after that, that I did that, and eventually, my co-librettist Lois Walden and I wrote a a, a, a libretto for an opera about it. Um, I by absolute fate, I met Andrea Clearfield, who came to the Rubin Museum in New York, which is the Museum of Himalayan Art. She came to see a little production of mine of the Tibetan and scenes from the Tibetan Book of the Dead. And she mentioned that she'd always wanted to write an opera about Milarepa. I said, well, isn't that a coincidence? We've written a libretto. <laughs> and then, and then um, another friend, Eva Banhidi, knew two people who she said might want to produce it. So that was wonderful. We found uh, uh, Terry Eder Kaufman, who was a, a concert pianist and a lawyer, and her husband, Jean Kaufman, who is an architect. And they became devoted to this project uh, altogether. It was wonderful. It was, it was as if Miller Repper were telling us how to think, how to live, how to be in this particular time of COVID, actually, um, at a time when the world is really difficult for so many of us. It's a when, way when of, you, of, of interiorizing. When did you embrace Buddhism? When did I embrace Buddhism? Well, I when 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 the serpent was playing in uh, in in Europe after we opened in Rome, I went up to see uh, my friend Tanya, who had become the secretary of the newly arrived Trungpa Rinpoche in Scotland. So that would have been uh, around 67, 68, something like that. I had a privilege to know him from very early on. Uh, he was at that point, Trungpa Rinpoche was 27 years old. He became one of the leading uh, bringers of Buddhism to the United States and, and, to, and to the Western world in general. He also had a way of teaching which he called crazy wisdom which was extremely uh, appealing to me. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, and it, you are now today, you are at, uh, at the, the, the Shantigar um, compound. The, well, yeah, um, it's a farmhouse. Let's call it a farmhouse. It a is farmhouse. a farmhouse. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, and that's, and that, and, the, and, and there is, the table is two doors away, two rooms away from me, that table. It doesn't have nasturtiums at this very moment because this is winter. Those are nasturtiums from summer, but it does have that little collection of deities, uh, little little gods that are looking at you while you eat. <laughs> and tell me more about the foundation. What is it, and why did you found found it? Well, and what do you do today? Well, I, I mentioned I mentioned a bit about my theatrical history as a playwright and also meeting Trungpa Rinpoche, bringing those two, those two lines of action and feeling together has really been what my life's work is about, turns out. Bringing together the Buddhist teachings and profound acting exercises by acting exercises of, of dedicated people like Peter Brook and Josie Gertowski, bringing those together using theatrical exercises as spiritual exercises, as ways of centering oneself, of coming from a deeper chakra rather than simply from the head. The head has gotten us into a lot of trouble. Uh, thinking, thinking without being attached to the rest of us hasn't helped us terribly much. So doing that and particularly doing it in beautiful environment in a beautiful natural environment it's gorgeous around here. I spend a lot of my time clearing dead branches from a Zen path, which I've created in the woods. I love it there. I really do love it there. Uh, I love doing that. I can work out all my frustrations, my obsessive compulsive thoughts, moving the branches, putting them in big piles and appreciating the clear space that that creates.
You told me today that you were surrounded by snow. That uh, yes, you... it's it's amazing. It's it's very still. Snow on the trees, snow on the ground. Very very still. Strange. Yes. We are. Um, I'm going to interrupt our our sharing. I have noticed that. Um, people are uh, posting on the chat version and not the Q and A, uh, but we do have some questions for you. So um, one of them I was going to ask you uh, was about your relationship with Belgium. Uh, did you, uh, once you moved to uh, the uh, United States, once you settled in the United States, would you return to Belgium? Did you, how, how did your family relate to, to Belgium? Well, I would, I would have to take us to the moment in 1944 when the war was suddenly, there was, we, there was a celebration of the expatriate Belgian Jews that were living in Great Neck. It was over. Something had, some huge thing was over. Uh, my, mother, my mother wanted terribly to come back, to come back to Brussels. She was, it was her home, her, she wanted to come back. My grandparents did come back. My, my maternal grandparents did come back. My grandfather was a glove manufacturer. My father couldn't, felt he couldn't come back or he didn't want to come back because he was earning a good living in America. That was very yeah. important to him. So they stayed in America, but my mother never appreciated. I mean, she really, she, her accent remained. I think accents tell you something. Yes. My father worked very hard to scrub his accent and he, he managed quite well. We went back to Belgium. I guess that was a compromise between my parents. We would go back to Belgium in, in the summer times. I remember the first trip back was on the Noordam, the SS Noordam. We went to where we docked in Rotterdam. I remember on the way that I got very seasick I kept vomiting and in the in the in the in, in the state room. I went to dinner. I went the, again. It was disgusting. And my mother, <laughs> my mother, my mother had an expression very much like the expression you just made uh, of disgust. She said to me as I vomited into the sink. She said, "You're going to have to clean up this stuff. You have to clean it up. I'm not going to clean it up. I'm sure as heck not going to ask the steward to clean it up." So my image is of one of swilling it around in the sink and so forth. Anyway, clearly I was not, I was nervous about going back to Europe. <laughs> uh, uh, I remember Tante Dean, who was a great aunt of mine, met us at the boat with hopios. She had wrapped, she had taken the outside of the wrappings. This was a candy, she'd used her rations for it. She'd taken off the outside wrapping of the hopios and they were all in little silver paper. She brought that there for us to, to have, I, I was very touched by that. It seemed like a very different world, it was a very warm world. We went to my paternal grandparents' house at 212 Avenue Montjoie, which then my maternal grandparents were living in. Uh, it, it, was a, it was kind of a wonderful, warm place when I went back. And then we came back to New York and uh, to Great Neck, uh, where I went to school. I went to Great Neck well, High School. You you have a, a, a Great Neck contemporary here, our our good friend Joana Rabinovich. She uh, she she lived there. She she lives in Portugal now, uh, but she she grew up in uh, in Great Neck, and oh. uh, she's um, her she she actually her 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 parents um, had a, a a sort of an opposite experience. They were. Let's say there were exilees, Portuguese exilees in uh, um, in Great Neck, um, and so uh, she she says hello. Well, and hi, now hi, we have... I wonder. I wonder if I may interrupt you once. Yes. One of one of my feelings about Great Neck. I wonder if she feels the same way, but was that it was the opposite of whatever happened in the Holocaust. In other words, there was no death visible when I was growing up. People were there were no old people around. There was nobody dying around. The only, and, and in terms of race, the only black people that we saw were domestics. It was, it was a place of denial. So that had a lot to do with what I wrote later also. It was tearing down this beautiful facade. And um, yeah. So did, I wonder, does she have, did she have a similar experience? Was it all, all lovely and front? Joanna, we await for your feedback. And while you tell us what your memories of Great Neck were, I'm just going to ask some um, questions. Um, 
Isabel Magalhães asks if you remember uh, actually crossing the Portuguese border, the Spanish-Portuguese border. No, I don't actually. I, I know that we rushed from a hotel. My grandmother kept reviewing hotels in her journal, but we rushed from a hotel in Spain. She also describes people in Spain going around a, uh, a plaza, uh, moving around in a big uh, ceremony and celebration. But we went very, very fast, and I don't remember that, no. Okay. What I do remember is that my, my grandmother, when we were at that pension, um, she, uh, when I was with her, I planted apricot pits in the potted palms. And when I did That would have been back, here in Montesturil. Yeah. Okay. But no, but they didn't grow apricots, I discovered when I came back there in my early 20s. <laughs> <laughs> so you did come back to Portugal? I did. I did. I came back. Um, I came back with Joe and I came back after we had gone to Morocco and for a couple of weeks and we came back. I was terrified of planes at that point. Uh, it was after my mother had died. So we came back and we came back across uh, weeks by bus. And yes, I did come back. The only thing that I could find of that time was the taste of the frangipan pastries. That was familiar yeah. to me. <laughs> and that was it. Yeah. Um, we do have another question, and that is uh, from an anonymous participant. Uh, asks if uh, before embracing Buddhism, if you had a religion, if you were, and if you were a religious person. Well, whether I'm, a, I don't think I'm a religious person. I hope I'm a spiritual person. As part of his effort to protect us, my father sent me to the Episcopal Church to be confirmed when I was 12 or 13. So I did that. I remember then reading the Brothers Karamazov and asking the Reverend McKechnie one day why little children had to suffer. He thought I was a pain in the neck, and that was the end of my <laughs> being there. Uh, he was right; I was a pain in the neck. But I, I, so I was not religious. But I, I think that I was spiritual. I hope so. I mean, I think I, meaning I was trying to figure out what I was here for and was digging around for it. You told me when we talked first you, uh, in 2019, you told me that uh, your father uh, didn't see himself as uh, a practicing Jew and that he, in fact, uh, chose uh, la libre pensée, that he yes, was a libre penseur. Yes, he was libre penseur. And then one also has to consider that to be Jewish, you have to, in, from the Talmudic point of view, it has to be through the maternal line. And my father's mother was uh, she, Tilly Jacobs. She was she was Jewish, partly Jewish. Whether she was Jewish on both sides, I don't know. Um, there were there were there were constantly questions about. Although being three quarters Jewish was it the he went through all of these ways of protecting himself. But then again, he never practiced Judaism. He was and his father never did. And uh, he was not circumcised. I was not circumcised. Uh, but then you, there was no obligation to be so. You, he'd never been there. Uh, he'd never been to, to. And yet, when 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 Hitler invaded, there was no question but what we were Jewish. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, uh, Rui Afonso, historian and uh, researcher, Rui Afonso, asks uh, two questions, very specific questions. The first one is. Uh, you say Konrad Seifert of the Belgian embassy in Paris got a job for your father at the Belgian consulate in Lisbon. Who was Konrad Seifert and what were your father's duties at the consulate? I'm sorry, but I was a four-year-old. <laughs> I don't know. I just told you all I know. Uh, I have no idea. You can always spot with me. I, I do exactly the same. I have very specific questions. And I say, so well, really, what fine. were if you I, eating? I, know, I think specific questions are wonderful if I can give specific answers, but I don't know the answer. Uh, yeah. And the other questions is, um, uh, oh, actually, I think I can correct that. When you entered Portugal, how did your parents explain who Gerard Prunel was since he didn't have a visa? He did have a visa. He did receive a visa uh, from Sosa Mendes, so he was allowed to come in. Um, perhaps the issue at the Spanish border was actually the fact that he was traveled, he was a minor traveling alone uh, rather than um, um, a visa um, 
issue. Then and we wasn't have, related. Wasn't related to us. Yes. I mean, blood yes, relation. Yeah, really. there was no. There was no documentation allowing a, a, a minor, an underage, a person to travel. Uh, Andrea asks, um, "Did you forgive what Hitler and the Nazis did uh, to your people? And if so, how did you learn to forgive?" I. It's too much for. I. I, I cannot be the person who forgives. I, I'm trying, to, I, I, I try to, I try to be a loving person. I try to love the people that come along. It's too big, it's too big. Do I forgive them? I can't say, who knows? It's not up to me. I mean, I could say yes, but it has to do with how free I can be in my own life. It's how emotionally free I am. My way of, my way of dealing with it is to try to undo that terrible tension that was done unto me, so to speak, through the terrible tension that was done unto my mother, uh, and to live a good life, to relate to the people that I relate to from a deep place. If I can do that, then one can say that I, my body has forgiven them. I don't know. Um, another question from Philippa uh, is, um, you, mentioned, you mentioned your father had a good job. How did your parents get jobs when they arrived in New York? Well, my father had a good job. My, my, my mother did not have a job. She volunteered. She volunteered at the, I still have the apron from it. I think it was something with freedom. She volunteered at a, at a at uh, canteen. French. Yes, the Free French Canteen. She okay. worked there. My father worked, when we first got there, my father worked with the American Army uh, to headquarters somewhere to help give them uh, information or translation or something. And he worked there as long as they needed him, which was about a year. And then since he was a stockbroker, he found a job as, as a stockbroker, which was great. Yeah. Um, we have a, a question from um, someone without a name. Um, uh, how did you come across the Exiles Memorial Center in Studio? Be us. Well, how, how how did I think you came across me, didn't you? Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. We, we contacted so you, you. Yeah, yeah. So that question is for you. We we interrupted you. Uh, we um uh, actually uh, we um when I arrived at the Exiles Memorial Center, it was in 2018 after my maternity leave, and I I really wanted to focus on the so-called normal families, on the families that were not uh, kings in exile and governments in exile and actors in exile and so on. And so um, we started uh, doing uh, research by country. And then we came across the Sosa Mendes Foundation database. And we realized that before we did that, we could actually do a cross-reference of uh, the, the names on their public database with the names of those who filled out the hotel lodging bulletins uh, when they were here. The hotel lodging bulletins are this amazing resource. There are individual bulletins signed only by the adults who stayed here, foreigners. Um, this was required by law at the time. And so we could very easily do a, a cross-referencing and find out who among these people listed by the Sosa Mensch Foundation that had been identified had stayed in Kishkaj. We, we now have a list that goes up to 200 people, including children. Um, of course, we only find out about the children either through the foundation or then through additional research in other databases because the, 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 the historical archives um, lodging bulletins will not have information on the children. And so after that, we got in touch with Olivia and she very kindly gave us your contact information. And that's how we started talking. Um, are there many, uh, are there, excuse me, I'm interrupting you, but are there, are there other children who are still alive and around? Yes, we've interviewed five in total so far. Mm -hmm. um, we've, uh, we've interviewed, so publicly we've only, you're, you're the second. I hope to do uh, two more interviews in this setting, in this I mm -hmm. Remember series this year. Uh, and um, and you know we're very lucky uh, to 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 be able to to meet people over the phone and to to gather this information because it was really while the first time while we're, we're still were... alive. Of course, yeah. <laughs> well I'm still alive because there's COVID outside. <laughs> yeah. And uh, no, the issue was you know we were worried will people remember uh, because they're so young will they remember uh, 
of their time here, what will they remember? And, and we have met people that say, all I remember is the breakfast room. <laughs> but uh, that's good enough. Uh, it's yeah, it's part of this this experience of the refugee as a child. What a child refugee remembers things in different ways. Mm. You know, you're talking about the tension that you absorbed of your family, this need to be a good boy, the fact that you had this sort of universal drama of dropping a jug uh, over a, a wicker chair. This could have happened anywhere, but it happened here while your family was fleeing. So it had the added tension of displacement, of unwanted displacement. You weren't yes. just on holiday. Yeah, that was yet another thing. They certainly didn't need that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's so basically yes. That's 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 how we uh, we did uh, um, come across. Then Francisca asks, "What was the story your parents would tell you as a child? How did they explain the war and how or and being Jewish?" That's a very good question. The war, which was referred to as la guerre in French, of course, then we spoke, we, it was almost like a historical and emotional period. There was la guerre, there was avant la guerre, before the war, and there was après la guerre, after the war. It's as if we had crossed into an emotional territory. There were three different emotional territories. One of them was in Belgium, avant la guerre, uh, and then one was this terrible time of la guerre, which was rarely referred to. Uh, and then there was après la guerre, which is, we were in Great Nick and so forth. The truth is that they rarely referred to it. It's not like they said we were, I, I had to get a lot of details from my father by interviewing him really, when he was in his eighties living in New York City. I talked to him, he didn't want me to take notes because he felt endangered by that. Um, but I did remember a great deal of what he said. Um, my mother, my mother, my mother didn't speak of it either, but but she was, she, I think I was protective of her, just as she had been protective of me during the war. So it was odd how little, as I was growing up, the war was mentioned, or being Jewish was never mentioned. Mm -hmm. Since, since, as I mentioned, I was I was sent to the Episcopal. I, I wasn't denied. It wasn't said we're not Jewish. No one ever said that. But it was when I was 22, visiting my grandmother in Brussels, that she actually used the word "you're Jewish," you know. Jewish. And I thought, oh yeah, of course I know, but I, <laughs> but I didn't know. Yeah, literally. the first time I knew was when I was 22. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, uh, we just um, to be. <laughs> <laughs> We have um, a, a very important question, I think. Um, Jean Claude, how can we ensure that the younger generations never forget? We have to love them very much. That's one thing. I feel that some of the horrible situation that we're in now, and 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 behalf of the American country who voted the way they did, but negatively in my point of view. I think it has a lot to do with the way we raise children. I think we have to love them a lot, a lot, a lot, and learn, 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 learn to be empathetic yeah. and to admit our vulnerability. Yeah. And say, I don't know. <laughs> um, yes. w w one question here pertains to your Vanitali grandparents. Um, why did they go to England instead of staying with the group and, and coming to Portugal? Well, my grandmother, Tilly, was not well. Uh, she was, she, she, she got car sick. I, I, I don't know what it was exactly. She had some underlying um, illness. So she was a terribly kind person. She was always smiling and she was an opera singer. She sang, which was kind of marvelous to have her in the family, but she was not not well. Um, so they wanted to spare her going further, a, a long trip. Also my grandfather, he mentioned in a letter to a friend of his in England, the Pinchbeck, his last name was Pinchbeck, saying, I don't want to spend another war in Brussels. So it, it, it was just, I've had it, I want to get out now there was the luck of there being a ship which was reserved to Dutch nationals, which was leaving Bordeaux. So it was, I don't, I mean, I think it was his, it, he decided, he was a very decisive man. He was, 
very strict and he just decided we're going he decided yeah. i guess my grandmother <laughs> went along i don't went know along. If, but yeah i don't know if she decided or not so. um we do have another question from christina pearson uh did you have any school teachers in the u.s who had been soldiers in the u.s forces or who were holocaust survivors i don't remember that i did i did have a i did have a high school teacher who was the president of the United World Federalists, uh, James Blakemore by name. He, uh, he had a great influence on me. He was a high school teacher, but he, he was powerful. He died, he and his wife died in a plane crash uh, in Tehran, I think, uh, while I was a year or so after I was his student. But no, I don't remember that I had people who were Holocaust survivors as teachers, no. Uh, we then have uh, a, a final question. I, no, no, two more questions. When um, di first did you meet uh, other refugee families who also came through Portugal uh, in, um, in in Great Neck, or and um, when did you realize, truly realize, that you had escaped a war, that you had escaped certain persecution? Refugee families in Great Neck, there were. There were the friends which my parents had had in, in Belgium, the Beiersdorfs, the Hechts, the Levy Dobuses. Um, it formed a kind of community in Great Neck, those people. Did I meet others? Yes, probably um, Mrs. Gideons, and who, te who taught me French, and there were others in Great Neck. When did I realize that I had survived a war? Probably now. <laughs> and it's it, we can we can only admit a certain degree of emotional horror i think and the more we can admit it the more we have we free up energy to live now but i i'm still working on it uh um yeah. i'm yeah i'm terribly grateful for my life but i yeah that's about all i can say <laughs> Um, clearly, your, your relationship with your parents is, is, is striking a chord in the questions we're getting. We have one another question. Um, did you ask any difficult questions that were war related to your parents during that time and until your teenage years that your parents were uncomfortable talking about? You've mentioned the, the, the in a way that the, sort of the Jewishness, the fact that some people were just never talked about again. I don't think it was a, an active thing on my parents' part. If I would bring something up, they would answer me. It's just that they never brought it up. So I never said, are we Jewish? I assumed, I remember riding in a car with my father, who a, a visitor from Belgium would say something. And my father said, yes, it's, it, it was very hard for my father-in-law. He was talking about my mother's father, or it was, there was never, there was never an outright lie. It yeah. was just not talked about as important. So yeah. everyone survived as they could. Yeah, it was the non-saids that were um, that, that allowed is, you allowed you to 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 keep yes, going. Yes, it was a denial. Denial takes many many forms, and I think I think we we live in a lot of it now politically. So we have to watch out for it. And the, anti the antidote is to love ourselves and to love as much as we can. Okay. Um, a another question, and after that, we only have comments. So um, how did this experience from your childhood um, determine, or how determinant was this uh, experience from your childhood in your personality? And this is a question by Lisette. Really, my 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 uh, aunt, my uncle Jacques' wife, was called Lisette. So, <laughs> but she's unfortunately no longer with us. She lived a very long time. Uh, how did it affect my personality? Well, that assumes that I'm outside myself and can make that kind of judgment. I am who I am. I've had a lot to work through. I've been very lucky. Um, I think it would have to be asked of my friends that question. I don't. I don't know how I can say that. <laughs> well, we've we've now uh, moved to the. Uh, we're moving now to the sort of the comments. Uh, oh no. Um, 
what um, what have you told your descendants um, about your past? Uh, let's assume nephews, nieces. Um, do you? I haven't I haven't spoken to them particularly, but I'm a type. I'm a kind of person who tells everything to anybody. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm today. Kind of yes, exactly. That's what we're doing here. I don't, exactly. I don't see why not tell people anything. There's nothing to be held back. Back. I think that was the mistake in a way of our of 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 the past generations. Yeah. So, say what you need to say. Say what you. What it, expose your vulnerability and realize who you're talking to, what effect it will have upon them, how they will feel. So it's not like a fact can be helped, can be withheld or spoken at a particular time. It's you who have to be free enough to relate from a deep place to the people you're relating to. Um, so now we're moving to the comments uh, part. Uh, so Margarida uh, says, thank you uh, so much for this work. It's very inspiring and very important uh, to preserve uh, these memories. It was a lovely conversation. I hope to attend more of these interviews. I am becoming addicted to the memories of the others. We learn so much. Uh, Olivia Mattis of the Susan Minch Foundation. Hi, Olivia. Uh, says, wonderful program. Thank you both. Um, and she, um, in a, uh, she asked me to refer um, the, the participants to the Susan Minch Foundation profile on the Van Itali and Brunel um, uh, visas. And I, I have shared the link on the chat room, uh, not on the Q&A board. Um, and Paula Afonso thanks us uh, both for this session. Then let's see if Joana, meanwhile, uh, answered. Uh, yes, she says, Joana uh, Rabinovich says about her experience in, um, in uh, Great Neck. Uh, well, my neighbor across the street was Jewish and survived the camps. And our next door neighbor was also a survivor. And this was between 1950 to um, 1956. So um, clearly you, 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 you overlapped in uh, yeah. there. Um, uh, someone asks where your books can be found. On um, Amazon. On Amazon. And um, let me just go back here. We're just about to finish. We're gonna go back here to, the, um, to our presentation. Um, I am using an, an older version of the presentation, so the, the button isn't here. Um, I uh, want to direct all of the participants to the Shantigar Foundation website and uh, tell our participants that the Shantigar Foundation uh, relies on donations as well. And uh, if you enjoyed our talk today, uh, go to the foundation's website, uh, click donate and uh, leave a token of uh, the appreciation for the time that Jean-Claude has given us. As would, for us, say, yes, may I go say ahead. something about that? Sure. I, 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 I want to say what the Shantigar Foundation, yes. what its mission is, which is creativity, meditation and engagement with nature. So it's bringing those things together in a disciplined way and to do it among friends who are also doing it each in their unique way. So not only donations, but please join us for workshops. We do a workshop called Home Theater on Thursdays at noon. We do a meditation workshop. I'm trying workshop. to join it, but it, it's right on uh, my child's dinner time. So it's a little bit difficult. I'm glad you <laughs> have I your really want to do it. right. Your priorities are exactly right. No, no we also have a, we have a meditation workshop led by Marissa Viola every Wednesday at noon. We're going, we have, please, please go on. And also I would love to show you the pictures that we have of Shantigar because nature is so beautiful here. Come to the uh -huh. Shantigar website, shantigar.org for more than just leaving donations, but donations are appreciated. So uh, Mark Crathorn, uh, he is of the British Historical Association in Portugal says, what an example Jean-Claude you give us with your calmness and your serenity. And uh, serenity. And uh, Joanne Halperin, um, uh, who will meet us in, uh, meet with us in March for the I Remember series, uh, says, I lived at 76 Berkshire Road and my mother was a Sousa Mendes visa recipient, Hala Krakwiak. Um, and um, lived with us at that address. 
Um, we are about to enter the final moments of our get together. It is getting close to 1030 or maybe shortly after. I just wanted to tell our participants that our next events are going to be in Portuguese. We will have an online course that starts on the 9th of February. It's a history course with Margarida Magalhães Ramalho and it's Cascais Land of Shelter. And it's a history course on the role of Cascais in the 1930s and the 1940s. So this one will include some of the royal families in exile for those who, who, who are interested. Uh, then on the 18th of February, we will meet at night um, again uh, for uh, to find out more about the Never Forget program for commemoration of the Holocaust with its curator, Marta Santos Paes. And then on the 18th of March, we will meet with Joan, who's, uh, who's become a good friend and with whom we are planning um, some educational um, activities as well directed at schools. And I hope you can join us for either one of uh, these programs. One way to find out about our programs is actually to ask to join our mailing list. And you can send us an email at this address. We send a newsletter once a month twice a month top. So, so we will not be swamping you with uh, information uh, and um, you can uh, certainly um, get in touch with us, ask to join the mailing list or ask to join any of these specific events and we will share the registration links with you. Meanwhile, more uh, question and answers have arrived. Uh, yes, I will share the website for um, Shantigar here, let me just uh, remove the sharing button. And Shanti, will... Shantigar meaning peaceful home in Sanskrit, named such by Trungpa Rinpoche. So it's it's here in the chat room. You can see the uh, address of the Sosa Mensch Foundation. Uh, Jean-Claude, I met you two years ago. Uh, it was a wonderful conversation that we had then. Mm. Um, I have... Uh, uh, wished you well from here ever since. Thank and you. And you, you met my so. you met my brother Michael also. I who did. Was American born here. Michael Vanitelli, yes indeed, and his wife. He came Marianne. here and we went for a walk and we, we saw the park where you played. Um, for those who know Monsterilo it would be Jardins Passerinhos. We um and we talked precisely about your family's um, experience here. Um, thank you so much for giving us your time to come here and to thank talk you. to these people. Uh, thank you to whoever created the system that we can meet across an ocean <laughs> and just in Portugal, have a wonderful evening and with you, uh, and be ready for dinner. Thank you so much. You've done such a beautiful job, Inez. Thank you so much for making all of this come to life and making it clear, not only for me, but for many people and for the future. Thank you. This is the highlight of what we do. So thank you very much. Thank you everybody for coming and uh, we'll meet again soon. Mm. Goodbye. Bye.